There we go. All right. So I am Dr. Nellie Dixon <laughs> of the graduate psychology department. I teach applied behavior analysis as full-time faculty and also a mom of a young man. Well, not so young anymore. He's 29 um, with autism. And Linda? Hi, I'm Linda Mitten and I teach in the undergraduate psychology department and I teach uh, both general and addiction psychology courses. And I too have a young adult son who is on the autism spectrum. All right, so if you are here, please know that you are not alone. Um, we know that parents and caregivers of children of all ages um, that are diagnosed with autism or not um, have um, higher levels of stress, anxiety, and depression than those that are typically developing or diagnosed with other disabilities. So a lot of the information that we pulled today is based on um, some of the research literature. So what we're bringing to you is um, has been studied and, and recognized and um, identified. So it's some of the uh, challenges that we as parents or caregivers face when we're raising um, a child or an individual diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder um, there's something down this list may resonate with you. So feeling unequipped to respond to challenging behaviors, right? Challenging behaviors arise and you're just like, I just don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. Um, feeling a lack of control, right? You, you don't always have control over the situations. Um, that can lead to increased levels of despair or even self-blame, right? Saying, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Or um, are they diagnosed with autism because of something I've done? You know, having blame and having guilt. When you're trying to raise a, an, a child with autism and you're dealing with a lot of those challenging behaviors, um, and sometimes you want to uh, pull back and, and not engage in as many things, not engage in as many activities, you might start to feel feelings of social isolation or stigmatization. Um, stigmatization. So maybe other friends uh, that you have have children as well, and they are typically developing children. So it's difficult to set up play dates um, or have you know mom dates because of the, the situation of being um, a special caregiver. Um, increase marital stress is something that creates, uh, creates some barriers, um, post-traumatic stress disorder or toxic stress, um, and that leads to fatigue and burnout. So Desiree, yes, I see your hand is raised. Um, so my brother has a 13-year-old autism boy, and he's like not, he's autistic, you could tell, but he's not like mm -hmm. full-blown autistic but like is it normal for a, an autistic <laughs> child to stand like really close to a tv mm -hmm. yeah okay. there, there are um there are lots of different types of what we call perseverative behaviors um that individuals with autism can display right and maybe that's some type of self-stimulating behavior where there's the lights or some kind of tracking on the tv that they're that they're looking at or maybe okay yeah because we tell him to back up from the tv and then like five minutes later he's back in front of it so <laughs> but he's gotten better he's he's like borderline autistic mm -hmm. yeah well we all we all have our things right and sometimes um some of the characteristics of of our individuals with autism sometimes they seem a little quirky you know, which is fine because we're all quirky. But yeah, you'll find sometimes some more unusual type behaviors and um, that are either self-stimulating um, or, you know, sensory based. They're trying to, to fulfill some sensory. I'm wondering if my two-year-old might have a little autism because like she'll be sitting on the couch and she'll like be like not shaking, but she'll like get excited to where you shake when you're excited. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that part of autism? I mean, that's hard to say, really. I would I would say if you have some concerns, you might want to just follow up with your pediatrician about, about some of those things. Okay. So acting in the role of the caregiver, right? There's one, um, one process called ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or Training, um, which is an evidence-based practice, and that supports individuals, caregivers such as ourselves and others, 
to be able to strengthen what we call psychological flexibility, right? Psychological flexibility is the ability to uh, be flexible, right? In terms of your thoughts and, and how that leads you to act in a particular way. So we're gonna look at these six key processes of ACT that you see on the slide here and uh, explain a little bit about them and how they can relate to um, being able to implement some strategies and some tips to develop that psychological flexibility and then uh, lighten up the, the load of stress that you may be feeling. So if you look at this uh, diagram here, we have those six processes contacting with the present moment, right? Which is looking at, you know, imagining things that are going to happen in the future and stressing about them versus, you know, ruminating on things that happened in the past, but being able to step back and contact the present moment, which is um, where Linda's part of the presentation is really going to dig in. Um, we're going to talk about values and how to let values sort of be your compass um, committed action is really that way in which you choose to move forward in, in a challenging situation. Um, self as context is a way in which we talk about ourselves, right? How we, the stories that we tell um, about ourselves, those things that are in our mind that, that give us messages. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about fusion and diffusion, right? How to remove ourselves a little bit from some of those challenging thoughts and feelings and um, and we're going to actually start with talking about acceptance, right? Acceptance and avoidance, because when we get into stressful situations, um, and you know when we feel like our pot's ready to boil over, um, it can be hard to accept the circumstances that we have, right? So all of these elements are going to give us a little bit of a roadmap to try to reduce levels of stress and develop that ability to be more flexible. So research has shown that um, acceptance um, and the ability to adjust and accept, um, particularly in mothers of children with autism, has been shown to decrease depression um, and they have higher levels of life, life satisfaction than mothers or caregivers who, uh, who haven't accepted sort of their situation, right? So um, mothers or caregivers who engage in self-blame and have feelings of despair and depression um, have less psychological adjustment, less psychological flexibility, right? So they have um, lower levels of life satisfaction. So ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, is this evidence-based experiential approach um, that can be used as an intervention, and you don't have to go to a therapist or a counselor to kind of move through these processes. These things can actually work pretty quickly, um, and it's demonstrated success in reducing stress and anxiety and depression, specifically in autism caregivers, um, as well as reducing the caregiver's perception of the challenges that are that they are facing, right, in terms of their child uh, engaging in disruptive behaviors. Um, and things of that nature. So using these approaches can help to reduce the, um, the stress that you feel. So we talked about acceptance, right? Um, and avoidance. And really these are two sides of the same coin, right? So avoidance is something that many of us turn to in the moment in order to resolve a problematic situation, resolve a challenging situation, or move away from stress, right? So when we are in the presence of uncomfortable thoughts, uncomfortable feelings, or challenging situations, as humans, right, we're programmed to avoid these things, right? It triggers a stress response in our bodies, and we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? That's a, the no body's normal response to higher levels of stress. So when, as a caregiver of a, or of a person that is on the autism spectrum and you're dealing with these challenging situations and these uncomfortable thoughts and feelings frequently, you may start to um, walk on eggshells, right? You wanna avoid triggering problem behaviors in your child, right? Maybe you're gonna give in in order to stop problem behaviors in the moment, 
or maybe you just isolate, right, and avoid situations that could bring about some type of anticipated problem behavior or challenging situation. Right. That's what avoidance does when we when we do that, that flight response, um, we just sort of try to get away from those things. So we feel better in the moment. Right. But the acceptance piece is learning how to say, OK, I know that going to Walmart is going to be challenging. I know that there is a possibility that, you know, they my child could engage in some problematic or disruptive behaviors. And if I know that ahead of time and I can say, you know what, I am going to be, I'm just going to be prepared to deal with it. I'm going to know it's coming. I'm going to accept that it's a possibility, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because I need to get bread and milk and, and things like that, right? So that acceptance is that other side of the avoidance coin. And that's really what we want to learn to move towards so how do we work towards acceptance, right? So on that diagram that I showed you with the six processes of ACT, we also saw one called values, right? And values is really that motivating factor. Values is that thing, um, that, core, that core belief that is going to help you jump over some of those hurdles so that you can move towards accepting some of these challenging situations, some of these challenging feelings um, and the stress, right? So values are not about what you want to get or achieve. They're not, they're not goals, right, that you want to get towards, but it's really a compass of how you're going to continue to move forward on an ongoing, base, uh, ongoing basis. So how do you want to treat yourself or how do you want to treat others? How do you want to function in the world around you, right? These are based in your core values. So an example to how it could relate is um, with regards to the value of family relationships, right? Maybe you've identified it's really important for me to um, make sure my family is close knit and that we all have close relationships with one another, right? That's a value. And maybe part of that is, you know, every night you have family dinner and it's important to catch up at the end of the day. Everyone sits at the table, you know, you talk about your day, you get in tune with everyone. Um, but if you have a child on the spectrum and they don't sit at the table for more than two minutes at a time, right? They sit and then they, they're off. They sit and then they're off. They're sitting and then they're off. And it can be exhausting constantly bringing them back to the table, right? So after that happens enough times, you might start to get really frustrated and just say, oh my gosh, like I can't do this anymore. Like I'm just, I just wanna eat my dinner, right? Um, so, you could do that, right? You could say, forget it. Just, just let them run around, let them play with the toys. We're going to have dinner. Um, and then I'll feed little Joey later on, right? Um, but then when that becomes a pattern, you're moving away from that family value, that relationship value, right? So if you can, in that time where you're just like, oh, I just want to eat my dinner, right? If you can tap into, but it's really important for us moving forward to be able to develop this skill so we can have our family dinners, right? That may drive you a little more just to say, you know what, this is temporary, and, and but we can do this, right? So even though I'm going to miss out on some meals and have to be bought back and forth, you know, uh, to, to collect little Bobby, bring him back to the table, Sooner or later, we're going to get to the point where he's at the table and part of that family dinner, right, which is in alignment with my value of family relationships. So you'll always want to bring yourself to that value, right? Let it kind of strengthen your, strengthen your willpower to follow through with what you know is going to give you the long-term results that you want, as opposed to that short-term avoidance and relief. Okay, so that's going to have a much more lasting impact in the future, right? Because you have to think about, too, time is going to pass, right? Six months is going to go by regardless. And you could let six months go by with Bobby running away from the table every two minutes, 
Um, or you can, and, and just letting him be and eating your dinner or six months can go by. And for the first month of that, you're struggling and working towards bringing him back to the table, right? But then the next five months is going to go by after that. And you're like, hey, look at this. We're all sitting at the table together. This is fantastic, mm -hmm. right? So Desiree, yes? Yeah, okay. So this isn't really like a question for like kids mind child's not autistic but she has trouble like sitting in front of the tv and eating dinner so i have to shut the tv off to get her to eat is that normal for a two-year-old without autism or sure yeah i mean okay yeah and i think any kid is really kind of tied to you know attracted to screens um these days because screens are everywhere right so tvs yeah. or, phones or ipads or whatnot so i'm sure that um it's because i try really and turn the tv off when she eats but she like breaks out at me yeah, well and then you know something and then you have to look at what is what's most important to you right and why is it important that the tv is off Right. Yeah. And then you go through, you move through that struggle of every time it happens, you turn off the TV anyway. Right. And, you know, yeah. you accept that she's going to have a little tantrum. But at some point, if you're consistent with that, then you're going to get eating with the TV off. Right. But it's just a matter of keep coming back to that and being consistent and and knowing that it's going to be challenging, but being OK with meeting that challenge. OK. So the next part of that ACT um, paradigm is that self as context, right? So self as context is, you know, what stories do you have about yourself? What do you say to yourself in your mind when things get tough? You know, what shows up for you? And how does that self-talk determine how you choose to act, right? So you may have gone through, you know, you may have had some of these things move through your head. Like, I am not strong enough to handle this. I, I can't do this, right? Um, and then how does that affect what you choose to do next? Do you turn around and just, you know, go sit and, and watch Netflix because you just can't deal with it, you know, or does it affect you in a different way, right? You might say, um, no matter how hard I try, this is never going to get better, right? I am not a good parent. These are things that you say to yourself, right, about yourself, but that doesn't mean that they are true, right? These are really just, these are stories. <laughs> these are stories that you tell yourself. So what I thought might be, um, I don't know, therapeutic, and you're free to um, share, and you're free to not share if you're not comfortable, but I thought, you know, you might want to share what are some of those self-talk, <clears throat> excuse me, ideas that go through your head? You know, what have what have you thought that might hold you back? And you can share in the chat if you want, or you can you can put on your microphone if you want. Well, I'll I could say something for just a quick second. Um, because I know. As a parent with twin boys recently diagnosed, um, there's definitely the worry and I, the, you know, how, how can I let them um, grow up without me? You know, like just that concern that um, they are because, you know, watching how they're struggling right now as 10-year-olds, you know, making sure that, I, you know, how, I don't know how to make sure they can be self-sufficient as adults. And so there's definitely that scare in there. And granted, I feel that way about my neurotypical daughter <laughs> as well. But I, so I know it's a kind of a typical parent thing, but I just, I feel it especially with them. And, and it's, hard to talk through that sometimes it's hard to calm that fear down because it, it definitely rises up hard uh some days right right so your language is kind of like i i don't know how to do this right i don't know how to make sure they're self sufficient or make them as independent as possible right and that's uh, my son's 29 <laughs> and we are continuing to work 
on on all of that as well, right? And I know that Linda is is also in that in that same area. Um, I do see you, Desiree. Hang on. But you know that story. How can you then maybe turn that around, right? I don't know how to help them be self sufficient. What's something that maybe you could do to change that story, change that message that you're telling yourself? It could be something like, I can find, uh, I can find a way to increase their independence with um, some life skills, right? It doesn't have to be a big thing. Maybe, it, maybe it's I can teach them how to do their laundry, right? Because that's one skill that is important for someone to be self-sufficient, right? I can teach my sons how to make a meal right? That's another skill. So instead of looking at it in such a big picture, right? I don't know how to, what can you do, right? And what, what is, what is something that's in your wheelhouse that you, that you can move towards that a little bit more easily? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You, you actually touched on something that I'm always telling my students where, you know, big changes start small. So rather yeah. than trying to do the all encompassing life, uh, right. to, to focus on some little things at a time. Yeah, yeah. no, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, life is Thank way you. too big. You have to start, you know, what are, what are, what is one thing right now that I can work on to teach them to increase their independence, right? Doing laundry is a great one because I hate doing laundry and I love that my son does his laundry from soup to nuts, <laughs> you know, unloading the dishwasher, loading the dishwasher, you know, starting with simple chores, learning how to clean the bathroom, um, and, you know, and these are all independent life skills. Yep. Oh, but yes, those big changes start small. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Desiree, you wanted to share something? Yeah. Um, so the story I always tell myself is sometimes like, like you were saying, stress. I get really stressed and I just want to blow. And, you know, I tell myself all the time, I can't do this. Like, I can't handle her. She's too much. Like because she's two, so she's going to throw her fits, you know, mm -hmm. and with all three of my kids, yeah, it's a struggle because, you know, one of them's 10, my oldest is 10, my middle boy is seven, and then my youngest girl is two. So there's a big age difference there, but with my two-year-old, it's, I just, sometimes I just snap and I can't take it. And I don't know, like, the barriers, like, I don't know how to set barriers or boundaries or anything to get her to listen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to so me. I understand. I understand, especially when they're two, that can be really challenging, right? <laughs> that can be very challenging. And in terms of your own um, sort of your own thoughts, right? When you're when you feel like you're gonna, I can't do this anymore, right? Um, Linda has some some good thoughts on ways that you might be able to help navigate that as well, right? Just from your own personal standpoint, um, because it really starts with it really starts with you, and it starts with your mindset. It starts with me, and it starts with my mindset. And then what I what I put out there is going to affect the situation with my child, right? Mm. So if I if I explode and I kind of feed into the chaos, the chaos is just going to get bigger, right? But yeah. if I can try to keep myself down, right, keep my keep my mood or keep my um, excitement down, then that's going to help my child to be able to bring things down too, right? Mm. That, that chaos breeds more chaos. But when yeah. we kind of diffuse a little bit, then that helps to diffuse the situation overall. Like, and I had also had another question. She, like, she has really bad separation anxiety. Like, if I leave or if I go to another room, she freaks out because I'm not there. What are some coping mechanisms or barriers that you guys would suggest on trying? Well, I think, um, you know, I mean, this particular, this particular talk is not specific to, to that um, that topic right now, right? And yeah. um, and I certainly don't want to not address it, but I also want to make sure that we're covering the content that we had planned for today. Um, so uh, I think, you know, it 
it would be number one in terms of behavior and, and some of your concerns if you reach out to your pediatrician. Um, they may be able to also give you some additional support and resources to be able to work with, work with your concerns. Okay. All right. So we're going to um, keep, whoops, we're going to keep going here. What are, how are we on time? Actually, I'm going to kind of keep moving. So this is a, a little video and I'm just, I'm actually going to um, pass through it so that we do have enough time to move through the whole presentation. But this is called the struggle switch. And the struggle switch is something that we all have, right? Um, and just like Desiree's kind of talking about, we have this struggle about wanting to, knowing we shouldn't like explode, but we're so upset, we just like kind of flip that switch. Um, the, the struggle switch is actually a, a in the toolbox. So the last slide of our presentation is a whole toolbox of, um, of links and things that you can watch. So I'm gonna uh, refer you to, to that, or if we have time at the end, we can always come back and watch it. But I do wanna make sure that um, Linda has enough time as well. So stress, tough to deal with thoughts and emotions. Yes, I think we, several of us have already established that that's the case. So one of the other, <clears throat> excuse me, concepts of ACT is diffusion, right? Let's diffuse, right? Let's diffuse the situation. Um, and I know it's spelled differently, but this is how ACT spells diffuse. <laughs> so diffusion techniques can really help to lighten the magnitude and the grip that these negative thoughts and these frustrations and these emotions can have on you, right? And when you can sort of step away from those feelings and emotions, that gives you an opportunity to have a clearer sight on your values, right? You're more able to focus and think back, what is my value? So some of the exercises, one is called thank your mind. And it sounds pretty silly, but when, you're, when your brain says, you stink as a parent, right? You don't know what you're doing. Um, you can say, thanks mind, thanks for sharing, right? Because then you're kind of addressing it as somebody separate from you and not as, as you, right? Thanks mind, thanks for sharing, whatever. You know, you could say something like, instead of I am, I am never gonna be any good at this, you could say, I'm having the thought that I'm not very good at this, right? I'm having that thought. And just putting that little phrase, I'm having the thought that removes you from it's me, right? It's me that is not this. It's, I'm just having the thought. You could imagine putting your story, right, on a movie screen and pretending you're sitting in the, the movie theater eating popcorn, watching it play out, right, as an observer, as opposed to you being stuck in the thick of it. Um, or this is my favorite one, and I tell you this works like nobody's business, repeating the thought several times in a silly voice. Or if you have a voice changer on your phone or like get one of those voice changer apps, you can put it in the phone and just say, I am a terrible parent, right? And then you can play it on, um, on alien speed. I am a terrible parent. I am a terrible parent, right? Or you could put it on like super fast forward, like mouse, mighty mouse speed, right? And when you listen to that, right? See, like Linda's chuckling and I'm gonna guarantee somebody out there has a little smile on their face, right? That's what it does. It brings this like ridiculousness to it and, and that separates the, the like, ah, from, from what you're actually telling yourself. So it works. If you got a Tom the Cat, I think people, some people have like Tom the Cat app on their phone. Um, yes, it is hysterical. Um, totally works. So this is a quick video about thanking your mind. And again, it is also in the toolbox. So um, I'm going to skip over that because... Uh, I kind of gave you an example of what that looks like, right? You don't know what you're doing. Thanks, mine. Thanks for sharing. Mm, whatever, you know, and then you just kind of keep going about your business. So that leads us to committed action. Committed action is really those behaviors that you choose to engage in or not, right? Um, but committed action is committing, right? Accepting and committing to doing something that's going to move you towards your values, towards those things that you've identified as having that long-term importance, right? So, and it doesn't have to be, right? Like, um, I think it was Sarah said, life, right? It doesn't have to be life. Don't address life all at once. Start small, 
right? What's an example? Committed action. I can bring my child back to the table during dinner time. That's it. That's all I have to do right now. That is my committed action, right? And then after a little while, you're going to maybe change your committed action, right? I can put a new food on my child's plate each day. I know they're probably going to throw the peas across the kitchen. I know they're probably going to have a tantrum. I'm going to accept the fact that it's there, but I am still going to put that new food on my child's plate each day. And if I have to pick up the peas after dinner, I will, right? I can meditate for 10 minutes each day, right? 10 minutes. How much time do you spend scrolling on your phone? Probably more than 10 minutes, right? Um, take 10 minutes of that time and just... And again, so what is one of your committed actions? Think for a second, I can what? Put something, think of something, what's challenging to you that you're struggling with, that you really want um, and hold a value about. What's a small committed action that you can make, that you can do? And you can chat or you can mic. I know I have been working on the new food uh, trying. It's it's a slow progress uh, process to be sure. I know it helps a lot when I am doing the new food with familiar things mm -hmm. or they have to have like two bites of the new food and then they can have some things they're familiar with. Right. And that has helped so far because it's gotten them to try some vegetables. I mean, granted, they didn't like them a whole lot, but they still tried them. Um, and it really helped a lot with getting the kid, uh, the boys accustomed to eating meat more mm -hmm. so that they're open for more kinds of protein, which is nice. But it was, it was, it was that was a very slow going thing and it, it needed a lot of patience. Yeah. Um, but, but and it's it up to you. It makes a big decide. difference in the end. Right. It's up to you to decide. I'm I'm going to do this every day. Something new on the plate. Period. Right. And and it is going to be slow. Right. But slow and steady wins the race. Slow and steady wins the race. It's the consistency that matters most. All right. So then um, we learn how to strengthen our act muscles. Right. So you've gotten all of those little bits about those different concepts. Um, there's different processes. So your values, right? Identifying your values, accepting versus avoiding, right? And accepting, yes, this is going to be hard, but I can do it, right? Because I have this value in mind. You know, I might tell myself stories, but I'm going to kind of separate myself from that um, using some of these little techniques or putting it in a silly voice or saying, yep, thanks, mind. I'm going to just going to keep doing what I'm doing anyway. Thank you. Right. And then um, there, there is this process where you want to continue to strengthen your act muscles, strengthen the opportunity for you to be able to stop and notice. So I'm going to turn it over to Linda because Linda is going to talk about mindfulness and that present moment awareness that's going to help you be able to incorporate all of these other aspects into your life to develop that psychological flexibility. I like to call psychological flexibility like yoga for your mind. All right, Linda. All right. All you, my dear. Thank you. Um, it does not appear that I can change the slides, though. All right. Well, let me do that for you. Thank you. So there's a lot of talk in the everything from social media to research to other various areas now in recent days on mindfulness. And so I wanted to just really quickly touch on what mindfulness is versus what it is not. So just quickly first, a couple of things that it is not or that it might be sometimes confused with. So mindfulness is not the same thing as meditation. And I think this is probably one of the biggest areas that there's sometimes confusion about. Um, and then there's other things listed here. It's also not a religious practice. It can be part of some of these things, but mindfulness itself is not these things. It's also not relaxation. And in fact, sometimes it's not very relaxing. 
um, or it can be. So some crossovers, but these are not part of the core definition. It's also not control, like, ooh, I'm going to sit and I'm going to be mindful and I'm going to control what happens in this time. Or in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it may or may not be feeling good. So there's several things that um, I think are typically thought of that are not. So what is what is mindfulness when we think of a definition? Um we're looking at some core components. So mindfulness is purposeful awareness, on purpose paying attention to what is going on and being present in a given current moment. So we're not dwelling on the past with things like regret or the future with, oh, what if, and back to those stories that Nellie was talking about, those could tie in, but also it's also purposeful noticing. And this part is where you are in a purposeful attentional state. I know if I've said that word purposeful several times, but really this is what we are doing. When we are being mindful, we are saying, okay, I'm going to set aside this time. And I'm going to talk a minute about lifestyle where that's more of a personality trait versus a mindful moment and we'll separate those out but it's it's that act of paying attention and being in that moment where you're like all right right now I'm going to be here I'm going to notice what's here I'm going to notice the things and the sensations around me and then it is non-judgmental and that part is so key in you know yes we notice we, we, we see and hear and are aware of those thoughts or feelings or what the child may be doing in the moment, but we're not attaching value to that. We're just saying, okay, I, I'm having this thought that. So the one other thing is that mindfulness is a practice where you have these certain exercises that you would do, and then that would be the, the act of, you know, doing a mindful exercise where you're training yourself essentially to be more in that present moment. And really and truly, as you practice those things, it becomes a little bit easier. Easy, no, but easier. And it can help you to then um, be mindful in those daily moments and as you're going through life and, and with your child and so on. Next slide, please. So one of the, I think, challenges as a parent or caregiver is, oh, okay, right. Yeah, like I've got, and more minutes to be, you know, practice mindfulness today. And I think there's two parts to that. Yes, usually if we, if something is a priority, we can find those 10 minutes. But also mindfulness, the beauty of mindfulness is you can bring this type of awareness into what you're already doing. So if you are already sitting and, and drinking a cup of coffee, this is truly, this has become one of my favorites, honestly, and we're going to do a little exercise to kind of practice that here momentarily. But you can practice mindfulness, start building those skills and so on while you are drinking that cup of coffee or cup of tea. You can look at what's around you, hear the sounds, smell the smells, and so on when you are already on a walk. And so then you're going to be able to do it more often, bring it in more often. And they really go hand in hand. So there's the separate mindfulness exercises that you can consciously do, but then there's these acts of being aware during those moments of your day. All right, so we have one to practice, and 
I don't know. Is this, this one's in the toolbox too, isn't it, Nellie? The, uh, the missing the, out one? I yeah. think we have time for this one. Okay. I wanted to save time for yours. Oh, no, I just have to switch my share real quick. Hang on. If your sales pipeline is starting to look like a conspiracy theory, you definitely need Monday <laughs> sales CRM. I have to move it's my it's embedded, so you should be able to just play yeah, it from I the just, slide. Oh, uh, will it come up? Oh, okay. My bad. It just, it opened, no, it opened up a new. Um, oh, okay. Hold on. Uh, As we get older, all right, Russ, more hang on and more of what we do in everyday life, we do on automatic. Bear with me, folks. And get back to the share. All these windows to make mm -hmm. As we get older, more and more of what we do in everyday life, we do on automatic pilot. We've done these tasks, these activities, these routines so many times. We take them for granted. We don't have to really focus on what we're doing. We don't have to put our attention into it. But the bright side of this is that while I'm doing these activities, I don't have to put my mental energy into them so I can put my mental energy into other things. I can think about other things. I can put my attention on other things that I consider to be more important or more interesting. But there's a dark side to this. And the dark side is that basically the more I give my day over to operating on automatic pilot, the more I miss out on. There are all sorts of things happening in my everyday life that I just don't appreciate. For example, let's look at what I just missed out on in making this cup of tea. So I just picked a simple example of making a cup of tea. But what would happen if we applied that principle to all of those things we do on a daily basis that we do on automatic pilot? We do them unconsciously. We do them in a distracted, unfocused way. We do them without really paying attention, without really engaging in what we're doing. How much richer and fuller would our lives be if we were to get better at actually engaging fully in what we're doing. All right. So um, that engaging fully in what we're doing is, I think, a great summary statement of what we're talking about when we talk about mindfulness. And I mentioned coffee is truly one of my favorites. Um, I, and I, I, I drink coffee more than tea, so, but whatever your beverage of choice, just, you know, those little pieces that are part of it and not skipping over that. So there's two pieces that we look at when we apply this to a parenting situation. And one is getting this grip on what general mindfulness is, and that's what we've been talking about. Um, and then mindful parenting. So being purposefully accepting in that moment while we're parenting. So general mindfulness, I mentioned, can be a trait or state. So the trait is just more personality related, your disposition. 
but don't be fooled, it can be learned. The state is that purposeful experience, sitting down and doing a mindfulness exercise. And it can be a formal um, mindfulness exercise. There's plenty that you can find online, maybe a video to guide you through. Um, and there are some in the toolbox. But then it can also be uh, that fitting it in, that I'm going to not just pour my cup of coffee. I'm, I'm going to watch the milk bubble in and, and so on. Now, this too, and Nellie mentioned this with ACT, but the mindfulness, this piece itself also does lower stress levels and um, it, it lowers uh, a variety of mental health problems and leads to overall greater well-being. So there's definitely some important aspects of doing this, both for yourself and for being able to, to efficiently and effectively parent your loved one. So then when we apply this to mindful parenting, we are, we're doing the same thing. We're doing these mindfulness things. We are being in that state of mindfulness, just inserting it into that role, that parenting role and the context of our parenting. So what that would look like is something like attention to the child and to the parenting, and that attention is present focused, being in that moment, and specifically that non-judgmental reaction. So important in this space, reacting non-judgmentally toward your child. So when they are in those moments that are pushing your values, just we're not going to judge. We're going to be aware and towards yourself. How am I handling this moment? You know, instead of inserting one of those uh, judgy statements, just, okay, I'm having a thought, those sorts of things. You can just tie it right into some of the tools that, that Nellie shared. And this piece is useful in regulating yourself and managing stress. I know I can sign up for the manage, managing stress part. Probably most of us as parents can. And I think too, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying to Desiree a little earlier, right? If we can step back and notice how we're starting to feel, right? Because we're, we're starting to develop that mindfulness muscle and we can identify, ooh, I'm starting to feel, I'm noticing that I'm like tensing up a little bit. I'm noticing that my, I'm getting a little flush, you know, um, and then being able to say, okay, I need to self-regulate a little bit, right? Because it takes that noticing piece to be able to pause and then engage in some, you know, a couple deep breaths, self-regulate. And the more you can self-regulate yourself as a parent, the easier it's going to be to help your child regulate as well in a challenging situation. Right, because that chaos breeds chaos. But when we can step back and we call that attunement or co-regulation, we can help to bring our own child back down to our level instead of rising up to theirs. And and when you're in that place where you're like, okay, I need to, you know, step back, I need to be aware, I need to self-regulate, then you could do one of these quick exercises. And this is how the mindfulness in general can relate to mindful parenting because you can, you can get used to them and learn the skills through trying some exercises. But then when you're in that moment where you're like, okay, I'm noticing something, I'm aware of something, you can do one or more of these simple little exercises. These are things that you can do virtually anywhere. You don't need special equipment because it's that present awareness, right? So it's noticing whatever is happening. If you're in a meeting, you can notice what else you hear, what you see, what you smell, what you taste. So an important part of this is, and this ties into the non-judgmental 
thing. When you first start trying mindfulness, if you haven't done it before, especially, distraction is so common. It's so, so common. And even after you've done it for a while, it can be so common. So you just notice it and then you let it go on by and you don't attach judgment to it and you just bring your attention back to the exercise. I kind of like the metaphor too, Linda, of um, I think about it as like shining a flashlight on something, right? Mm -hmm. And wherever the beam of the flashlight goes is, is kind of like your attention, right? That's where your attention is directed. So if you envision your attention as like a flashlight and you're trying to be mindful and then your mind sort of veers off into, well, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? What am I going to cook? I didn't take out the meat. It's still frozen, right? Take your flashlight and shine it right back down on how that chair feels, you know, while you're sitting or what the clothes feels like on your, you know, on your arms. Um, so it's really just manipulating that flashlight um, to, to keep bringing it back to, to where you are now. Yeah. So let's, um, as we wrap up and before we go to questions, let's try, we'll do the three, three, three. And essentially what that is, is you just notice. So in your setting right now, where you are, look at and notice and become aware of, shine that flashlight on, three things that you can see. Now, what are three things that you hear? And then what are three things that you feel? And that's like feeling, right? Tangible. Your your sense of your yes, not emotions. Good clarification. So like of the examples you were sharing, the uh, the the clothes on your your body, um, the breath moving through your nostrils. I think sometimes at first, especially, it, it can seem like, well, I I hear this speaker in this presentation, but I know for me, for example, when I said, "What are three things you hear?" and then I was thinking of what three things I hear, I heard a bird outside, and. If I hadn't stopped talking, I probably wouldn't have even noticed that. So that's how noticing these sensory things can draw you in to practicing that present moment awareness. All right. So this <clears throat> this is the toolbox that is at the uh, the end of the presentation, and all of these. Uh, all of these are clickable links that take you to little short little video vignettes, short little um, you know experiences that coincide with all of the information that we've uh, brought to you today. So certainly take advantage of um, you know engaging with some of that material to help further your journey and you know trying to navigate those thoughts and feelings and the challenges of being a caregiver to someone on the autism spectrum or not because <laughs> these are good for everyone yes everyday life any kind of parenting <laughs> yeah absolutely so i don't know that we have any questions at this point um unless melissa did you have any questions no very interesting to listen to. All right. Thank you. So with I, I that, think even if we're not parents, mm -hmm. with life, we can use these too. Yeah, absolutely. These these tools can work in so many situations. And for students. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when they're doing a paper or something and they're like, ah. Right, right. Well, and that's the thing too about um, like the acceptance and commitment, the act. Right, ACT is um, is an evidence based process that can be used pretty much for anything. The research base for how it can be used and the effectiveness 
is is so broad, you know, and this is fortunately one area um, that we do have research on in terms of supporting um, caregivers. Um, but I mean, really anything, you know, student stress, yes. <laughs> um, you know, just anything really. So hopefully it will uh, help some some of our students and uh, some of the viewers to be able to, to do that. Right. Yeah, I, I love just, you know, taking a moment and just hitting reset really through, you know, a, just a quick exercise like this um, in order to, you know, have some clarity while I'm through my going through my work day or, yeah, so many situations. All right. So I think we're at the top of the hour. And uh, I was, I appreciate the opportunity to have been able to present this information. Um, so those of you viewing it on the website, I hope you enjoy the presentation as well. Um, and certainly feel free to reach out with any questions um, to me or to Linda about any of the things that we've talked about today. So I'm at nelly.dixon at purdueglobal.edu. And mine is L Mitten, M I T T O N, at purdueglobal.edu. I can put it in the chat. And I wanted to thank you for giving this talk today. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, there we go. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.